A brand new study just came out comparing a ketogenic diet and a Mediterranean diet. It's called KetoMed, appropriately, and it's led by Christopher Gardner's lab at Stanford. The main question they were trying to answer was, which diet is best for people with diabetes or prediabetes? Both diets were designed to be clean, meaning that the participants were asked to avoid junk food, refined grains, and added sugars. And both included non-starchy vegetables like leafy greens. The main differences were the Mediterranean diet included legumes, whole fruit, and whole grains, while the keto diet avoided most of those foods, except for maybe some berries. The Mediterranean diet also had plenty of olive oil, characteristically, and the main animal product was fish, whereas the keto diet had more animal foods like meat, eggs, cream, etc. Now, the macronutrient breakdowns were approximately 18% protein, 39% carbs, and 45% fat on the Mediterranean diet, so fairly typical, and on keto, 24% protein, 12% carbs, and 62% fat. Now, I already know there's some viewers saying it's not low carb enough, because every time we make a video about a trial that's either low carb or low fat, regardless how low they go, there's 50 comments saying, oh, it wasn't low enough. Joking aside, it was actually pretty solid. The people on keto were asked to stay under 50 grams of carbs a day, and they actually averaged 43. And they actually had an objective measure of ketosis. They measured the level of ketone bodies in the blood of the participants. They asked them to try to stay above 0.5 millimoles per liter. And most of the time they succeeded. They were between 0.5 and 1.5, which the authors consider light ketosis, above 1.5 being optimal ketosis. We can compare this, for example, to the Verda study, which is a study run by a company that specializes in low-carb diets. And it's actually overseen by some of the intellectual leaders of the low-carb and keto movement. In Verda, they were also shooting for ketones above 0.5, same range as the keto med trial we're looking at, so that seems reasonable. In Verda, the participants stayed in average right above 0.5 for the first six months. By one year, most were under 0.5, so no longer in ketosis technically, and by two years, only 14% were in ketosis. Now, Verda is much longer than keto med, but even early on, they were right above 0.5, just barely making it into this light ketosis range. So it's just difficult to get people to adhere to these strong elimination diets. This is not specific to low carb. We had a recent video where we looked at a trial comparing Mediterranean to a diet they called low fat, and we saw that they had a really hard time getting the participants to significantly cut back on the fat. So this is just something we see consistently. So the issue is always that you're not dealing with mice in cages. So there's a limit to how much experimental control you have. On the other hand, when we're just choosing a diet for ourselves, this aspect of populational adherence matters much less. The only factor is whether you can stick with it. It doesn't matter how many other people can do it. Okay, back to the trial. So they looked at 33 people that were either diabetic or pre-diabetic. So it's not a large number of subjects, so that's a caveat to bear in mind. Although they used what's called a crossover design, where each participant goes on both diets sequentially. So in a way, you get double the amount of data. So each participant went on one diet for 12 weeks, then the next diet for another 12 weeks, and finally 12 weeks of follow-up where they didn't get any dietary instructions. So they could eat what they wanted. And the order was chosen at random. So approximately half of the participants did the keto diet first, and then the Mediterranean, and the other half did the Mediterranean first, and then the keto. The main parameter they were interested in, what's called in nerd speak, the primary outcome, was glycated hemoglobin, or hemoglobin A1c, as it's also known. And that's an average of the glucose levels over the previous three months. Both diets lowered hemoglobin A1c compared to the baseline right before the experiment. And there was no significant difference between the two. Now, honestly, when I read that at first, it was surprising to me. I expected both diets to generate an improvement, but I thought keto would have an edge. In type 2 diabetes, the carbohydrate processing machinery is sluggish. So there's two things we can do. In the short term, we can avoid excessive or super physiological glucose peaks while the machinery is still defective. That doesn't solve the underlying issue, but it avoids a problematic manifestation. The other thing that can be done is to fix the underlying issue so the machinery works normally. And the main lever to do that, shown in randomized trials, is to moderate overall caloric intake and to lose a little bit of the excess 
fat mass that people tend to carry. We covered all of this in a recent video where we talked to Professor Roy Taylor, a diabetologist from the UK. So any diet that helps with weight loss can help with the function of the machinery, with the underlying issue. This is why a lot of times you'll see some people saying a low fat diet reversed my diabetes and somebody else says a low carb diet reversed my diabetes or a vegan diet or a paleo diet. They're not lying. The common theme is they all eliminated or moderated ultra processed foods, calorically concentrated foods. So that helps moderate overall caloric intake. So I expected both diets to deliver a benefit because they're both clean diets. They're both low in ultra processed foods. And I thought keto would also help moderate the postprandial glucose peaks in that initial phase while the underlying machinery is still sluggish just because there's less glucose being eaten. And in fact, diabetes is one context where there's quite a bit of data showing that low carb diets can be a valid tool to help with glycemic control. Yet overall, the results show no statistically significant difference between the two diets. But I think when we look a little deeper, it does suggest a difference. See, in order to avoid hypoglycemia, in order to avoid their glucose levels from crashing too low, the participants who were on glucose lowering medication were asked to reduce it before getting on the diets. Now that's pretty standard in this type of dietary intervention trial. The problem is the participants who were about to go on the Mediterranean diet cut their medication in half, while the ones that were about to go on the keto diet completely eliminated it. So it's possible that the drugs that were still left helped the Mediterranean diet perform a little bit better, push the glucose a little bit lower, whereas the people on keto didn't have this extra help. To the investigators credit, they ran a separate analysis where they matched for dose of glucose lowering medication. And when they did that, the results do suggest an edge for keto being able to lower hemoglobin A1C a little bit more than the Mediterranean diet. Now the numbers of participants in that analysis are very low, so we have to be cautious, but the results do suggest somewhat of an edge. They also asked the participants to wear a continuous glucose monitor, which looks at the dynamics of glucose levels over the course of the day. And here again, they saw that both diets improved glucose control with keto performing a little better. So overall, both diets clearly beneficial compared to baseline. And the results indicate that the ketogenic diet may have an edge with regards to glucose control, at least in this time frame. And remember, the participants were in light ketosis. So it's possible if they were in deeper ketosis, the results would have been even stronger. Possible. The researchers also looked at blood lipids, and this was interesting. The ketogenic diet was better at lowering triglycerides, but it was worse for LDL cholesterol. Now that's a pretty common pattern in low carb trials, but it's by no means a necessity. And we'll come back to this in a minute. They also looked at body weight. Both diets delivered weight loss. It seemed like maybe a bit more on keto. It wasn't completely clear. If you remember, it was a crossover study. People who did keto first did lose significantly more weight than people on Mediterranean diet. But the people who did keto second, there was no significance there. So it wasn't completely clear. There's a bit of uncertainty. But for me looking at it, it does look like there's a trend for keto to lose a little bit more weight. Now, ideally, we'd want to know body composition. How much of the weight is actual fat mass versus lean mass? We know, for example, that with low carb diets, it's common to see early on a loss of glycogen and water. So we want to know how much of the lost weight is actual fat mass. But those details were not reported. And finally, they looked at what the participants chose to eat in that follow-up phase when the pressure is gone and they get to choose. And they found that they generally gravitated more towards a Mediterranean-ish diet and not so much a low-carb diet. And the researchers suggest this indicates more sustainability long-term or maybe a, a higher personal preference in default conditions. So bottom line, I really like this trial. It shows us clearly that each diet had something to offer and neither one was perfect. Mediterranean lowered hemoglobin A1C, but keto probably lowered it a bit more. And it was better for CGM parameters, but it was worse for cholesterol. Mediterranean was better for cholesterol, but keto was better for triglycerides. And Mediterranean might be a bit more sustainable long term. Now, at face value, we might think, okay, so I just got to pick one diet and compromise on the shortcomings. But I think this trial and all the evidence we've been looking at lately are giving us a much deeper and much more empowering message that we can tailor our diet to our needs using different features from all these different dietary patterns that we don't have 
to compromise on health, and we shouldn't. Let's say I prefer a low-carb diet, and I'm actually one of the people who can sustain it long-term, and I do well on it. Do I have to expose myself to high LDL cholesterol? Am I stuck with that? No. In this trial, people on keto were eating twice the saturated fat of the Mediterranean diet, and half the fiber. They ate as much fiber as the average American on the standard American diet. So it's entirely predictable that their cholesterol would go up. But it's completely doable to design a low-carb diet, even a ketogenic diet, with more fiber, less saturated fat, and more unsaturated fats. And there's lots of precedent for this. Studies have shown a low-carb diet rich in unsaturated fats helps lower cholesterol, not increase it. So this general idea that low-carb diets jack up your cholesterol, and that's something you just have to live with, is not a necessity at all. It's basically a misconception. I've been saying this for like two or three years now. I have old videos where I go over this. Real quick aside, LDL cholesterol is a marker of ApoB lipoproteins that carry cholesterol, and high ApoB raises cardiovascular risk. The evidence on that is abundant and unequivocal. We've covered that in a lot of previous videos. As far as the different types of fat, saturated fat generally refers to fatty meats, butter, coconut oil, etc. And unsaturated fat, it's things like nuts and seeds, fatty fish, and most vegetable oil. Okay, but maybe there's a disadvantage to unsaturated fats. Maybe they're better for cholesterol and for cardiovascular risk, but they're worse for triglycerides or for glucose. And maybe it's a trade-off. We actually have trials comparing different keto diets. Same proportion of protein, fat, and carbohydrate, just different types of fat. High saturated fat keto versus polyunsaturated fat keto. And what this trial found was that people on the polyunsaturated fat ketogenic diet had lower cholesterol, that's not surprising, but also lower triglycerides, lower glucose, and better insulin sensitivity. The authors concluded a polyunsaturated fat ketogenic diet may be superior to the classical saturated fat ketogenic diet for chronic administration. So yes, you can get the best of both worlds. And speaking of chronic administration, this is another caveat that always has to be brought up. We don't know what happens long-term on very low-carb diets. Five years, 10 years, 20 years on 10% or 5% of calories from carbs, what happens to disease incidence rates? Low-carb diets have been around for 100 years or more, but we don't have cohort studies with reasonably matched populations over the long run. I'm sure those studies will come eventually. Until then, it's a bit of a question mark. It doesn't mean people can't do the diet. It's just something that we have to bear in mind. Okay, so the keto diet is completely optimizable. The exact same thing goes for the Mediterranean diet. If I'm on a Mediterranean diet and I like it, but my triglycerides or my glucose aren't quite where I, where I want them, nothing stops me from tweaking from, for example, taking a percentage of the whole grains on my plate and replacing that with some unsaturated fat or some protein. That could be nuts and seeds, some legumes, some fatty fish. So understanding these simple principles allows us to fine tune our diet to fit our needs, whether it's low carb, high carb, intermediate carb, without having to go through these whiplash changes from one extreme all the way to the other. We marry the science with the individual circumstances to personalize and give the person the best odds, right? We don't ignore individual circumstances and we don't ignore the science either. And as we said, avoiding the glucose spikes doesn't necessarily mean the underlying issue is resolved. That could still be insulin resistant and diabetic technically and just not see the manifestation if there's no carbohydrate challenge to the system. So for type two diabetes, bearing in mind for most people, losing a little bit of that extra fat mass is gonna be beneficial. So whichever diet keeps you satiated and is sustainable long-term is gonna help you achieve and maintain a healthy body weight and improve your glucose metabolism. Some people do better on a low-carb diet, some on a low-fat diet, and some on neither. We see this individual variation in studies, and I hear it every day from you guys in the comments. So it's crucial to give people some options, some healthy options, so they don't have to fall prey to crazy fads. The all-bacon diet or the uh, rice and sugar diet, just because those help lose weight. And yes, both of those are real things I've seen on the internet. The authors say it themselves. There should be less focus on promoting one particular diet as best, and rather allow patients to make an informed choice to help them establish which approach is most suitable for them. A diet should not tie your hands. The diet should serve you 
not the other way around. I see people all the time struggling to stick to these diets and compromising. Oh, this diet is good for this, but it's bad for that. Oh, well, you don't have to play that game. You don't owe allegiance to a diet. Why shouldn't you take something good for both sides if it helps you? In fact, people have already coined the Mediterranean keto diet, a blend of both. The internet can convey this idea that diets are rigid structures. There's the low carb diet and the low fat diet. And if you deviate, you're a traitor and a failure. These are internet constructs. If your diet is giving you the results you want, short term and long term, optimizing your health overall, and you like it, stick with it. If not, tweak it, change it. Yeah, you can have your cake and eat it too, even if it is a low carb cake. So what are your thoughts on this trial? Did it give you some new ideas? Let me know below. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.